Good afternoon, everybody. After three, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Kimberly Miller, policy officer with the HIV Medicine Association, and I want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's HIVMA webinar on Accountable Care Organizations, or ACOs, and what HIV providers need to know. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the HIVMA website. And in addition, an issue brief is being released in conjunction with the webinar that will also be available on the HIVMA website. Uh, we will be in lecture mode during the presentations, um, and during that, uh, so the lines will be muted except for the presenters until the Q&A discussion begins. You may submit questions at any time during the webinar using the questions feature or over the phone. Lines will be unmuted during questions and answers. When asking questions, we ask that you please identify yourself and where you are calling from. This project was developed in partnership with Heart Health Strategies and is part of a series of health reform issues that HIVMA is addressing with grants from the MAC AIDS Fund and Janssen Pharmaceuticals. So just quickly, an overview of what we're going to be covering today. Um, our colleagues, Shana Christop and Emily Graham from Heart Health Strategies, will go over some ACO basics. And we'll then have our featured speaker, Dr. Stephen Boswell, MD, President and CEO of Fenway Health, is also an HIVMA board member, who will present on his experience with navigating ACOs as an HIV provider. And we will then go to some Q&A. So with that, I will let, turn it over to our Heart Health Strategies colleagues. Thank you, Shana and Emily. Great. Thank you. Happy to chat with you a little bit today about accountable care organizations. As I hope you know, accountable care organizations are a group of doctors, hospitals, and other health care providers who basically come together voluntarily to help organize coordinated, high-quality care to Medicare beneficiaries. The hope is that this process of integrated care will help control costs and meet quality care standards. Um, this program, or this pilot in many respects, was established through the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, also known as the ACA, and it's managed by CMS. Um, participants in the ACO include physicians, many of you on the line probably, nurse practitioners, other practitioners, physician assistants, hospitals, um, professionals in a group practice arrangements. So there's a variety of different individuals who can participate and to provide the integrated care. It matters mostly to CMS now that they have a, a group of great providers ready to sort of assist, as well as they must have 5,000 Medicare beneficiaries, fee-for-service patients, that are eligible to do that. And when you form an ACO, you have to agree to participate um, for at least three years. Next slide. One of the key questions that you have to sort of address front for joining the ACO is whether or not you're a one-sided or two-sided risk model. Because ACOs are eligible for bonuses if they meet certain quality performances, and that amount will kind of go over a little bit, is calculated based on your overall cost and what it should have been compared to what the Medicare fee-for-service payments might have been under if, if those patients had not been working with you. Um, and then you share in a portion of the savings. You don't get all of the savings for what you end up providing. It's, it's a portion of those savings. That's why it's called shared savings. CMS keeps some of it, and the ACO provider should receive an, the other portion of it. So under a one-sided model, you receive a financial award of 50% of the share of savings, but there is no risk involved in that. So if you overspend in that situation, you're not required to pay back during that. This one-sided model is only available during your initial three-year agreement. Um, subsequent agreements require you to move to the two-sided model. And the two-sided model, you do receive more of the, the savings. You get 60% of the savings, up to 60% of the savings. But the issue is, is that you also share on the losses. So if you end up having losses in the part of the process, you would have to pay back those losses to CMS. So let's kind of go on that next slide, please. So looking at the one-sided model, we're going to talk about some term terminology and kind of go through some numbers to help it make it a little bit easier to understand. So your specific expenditure benchmark is what CMS would have expected you to have spent on those Medicare beneficiaries for that certain period of time. So if that was at $1,000 and they had a minimum savings threshold of $980, so this is what you have to save. There's a, CMS has decided that there is variability in what you might spend and how much money you might save. So unless you go past this threshold, you're not eligible savings. So, so 
if you spend nine hundred and ninety-five dollars, while that would have been less savings, uh, there would have been savings. It wouldn't have been enough savings to actually trigger payment back from CMS. But if you end up doing an ACO, if you actually spent nine hundred and seventy dollars on those beneficiaries during that period of time, you would receive fifty percent of the difference between the total amount they expected you to spend once you actually spent. So a total of fifteen dollars in this example. So it shows you kind of how the numbers kind of come together, how CMS makes those calculations. So as we discussed the two-sided model, you can lose some or you can win some. So there's an example here that shows if you have an $800 benchmark and you have a minimum loss threshold of $816 and you spent more than that at $820, again, you would actually owe CMS um, uh, at $12, depending on your quality measures would have to go back to CMS because you spent more than what they expected you to spend. Um, and then the same thing sort of with looking at that, if you have a savings threshold, some additional numbers, you can see you can both receive bonuses as well as losses when it comes to those models. So it's really key, in, and part of this is understanding where those benchmarks come from, um, and because obviously they're key to figuring out whether or not you save or lose. And one of those key issues is CMS established those benchmarks um, based on Medicare expenditures on per capita Part A and B costs for beneficiaries assigned to your ACO in the three years subsequent to your agreement. So it's before they start working with the ACO, what did they spend on that? And then they basically sort of project forward as to what they think, you know, healthcare costs have gone up, so therefore they don't expect the cost to stay stagnant. But what that means looking forward, the ACO has no real input into that benchmark. That is something that CMS um, sort of develops in of them by themselves. And so we want to make sure you understand that there's very much risk inherent in that benchmark. And that's something you need to sort of kind of think about as you're sort of progressing into that. And that's particularly important even with CMS's information has shown a lot of statistical uncertainty with establishing those benchmarks. Um, in particular, it's highlighted that although CMS requires you to have at least 5,000 beneficiaries, um, 5,000 beneficiaries provides you with quite a bit of variability. Um, uh, you know, there's statistical probability that about 25% you would receive savings or losses irrespective of what you end up doing. And it's actually more like 50,000 or 500,000 patients that you end up reducing that variability enough to where it's there. So just highlight some of the issues that you know, providers may be facing is kind of looking at what those benchmarks look like and so forth. And now I'm going to turn it over to Emily um, to discuss additional issues with respect to ACOs. Thanks so much, Shanna. Hi, and welcome, everybody. So one of the um, other big issues with respect to accountable care organizations, particularly for specialty providers, has been how beneficiaries are assigned to the accountable care organization. Um, at this time, um, CMS is using what is known as a two-step uh, plurality of care model, in which um, the first step they assign a beneficiary to an ACO if the beneficiary receives the plurality of his or her primary care services from primary care physicians within the, within the ACO. And primary care physicians are very specifically defined as those that have one of four specialty designations. It can be an internal medicine specialist, a general practitioner, a family practitioner, or a geriatric medicine um, provider. The second step of assignment considers beneficiaries who have not had a primary care service, which is an evaluation and management code or an office visit code, furnished by any primary care physician as defined. Um, what they will do next is they will look at all the other providers, which are going to be specialty providers, and they will make their assignments to that accountable care organization based on primary care services provided by specialty clinicians. This has been a significant concern for a number of specialty providers um, because of the fact that there are some exclusivity issues that are related to how beneficiaries are signed. But we'll get into that in just a few, a few slides ahead. So with regard to quality measurement, this is another key component to accountable care organizations. And CMS um, expects ACOs not only to reduce costs, but also to significantly improve quality. And so what they've done is they have assigned um, 33 specific measures um, that are currently being used in other programs, but there are 33 measures that accountable care organizations are required to report on at 100%. And those quality measures cover a variety of different domains. So there are um, quality metrics that are related to patient and caregiver experience. There are seven of those, and those measures come from the CGCAPS 
survey. Um, there are also care coordination and patient safety measures. There are approximately six of those. In addition, um, there are measures that are focused on preventive care. And last but not least, there are measures that are related to certain at-risk populations. And right now, those at-risk populations um, include those patients with diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, coronary artery disease, and, and um, one other um, ischemic vascular disease. Of course, the only way an accountable care organization is going to be able to be successful is if they have enough robust data to help them better understand their population and what their providers are doing and how to um, change those behaviors to the extent that they are costing the program more money and then, of course, causing the ACO to lose out on potential savings. And so data sharing um, occurs at many different intervals within that three-year agreement period. Um, data is received by the accountable care organization at the initial phase, so that way it can start looking at what things that it might like to do and what protocols and guidelines and pathways it might want to put into place to help control some clinician behavior. And then throughout the year, um, additional data and reports are submitted to the accountable care organization from CMS so that way the accountable care entity is able to determine how it's doing and, and also see what is the likelihood of of a shared savings and what is the likelihood potentially for a loss in the future. Although one of the big concerns with regard to the data sharing is that the beneficiary actually has the option to opt out of having their data shared. So for example, within an accountable care organization, if the beneficiary stays in-house, the likelihood of them you know, being able to see all of that data is very high, but once they, if they move outside of the ACO and they see other providers, it can be more difficult for the ACO to have access to some of that data. So specialty providers continue to feel some concern and angst when it comes to discussions about accountable care organizations. Um, they don't feel that they were really included um, in, in the development of the ACO model and continue to believe that there are some uh, challenges that they face that are unique, um, unique to specialty care providers. Um, of course, as mentioned earlier, one of the biggest thing, um, one of the biggest issues that specialty providers have has to do with the two-step assignment process. And this is because if, you're, if you provide as a specialist any E&M services, which almost all specialty providers do see patients um, and bill for office visits, that automatically places you into a position where you must be exclusive to one accountable care organization as a participant. And that is irrespective of whether or not you actually have beneficiaries assigned as a result of your participation. So even if even if all of the beneficiaries, the 5,000 beneficiaries who are assigned at ACO, none of them can be attributed back to you, it doesn't matter. As long as you are billing office visits and you have agreed to participate in that ACO, you are immediately exclusive to that ACO. There is one or two ways to kind of finagle your way out of that particular exclusivity agreement although by doing that you're going to be losing out on a lot of that valuable data and information um, because you would be joining that ACO as um, what is known as an other entity. And that other means by which you can participate in an ACO was really not reserved for clinicians. It was reserved for other types of organizations that may want to have some sort of affiliation with an accountable care organization for other reasons. Um, and as you can see, one of the points that's highlighted here is that no NPI, which is your national provider identifier, and TIN, your tax ID number, no NPI TIN combination that has been used for purposes of patient assignment to an ACO can be associated with more than one ACO. Um, one of the things that CMS has did do um, when they developed the ACO program is they included um, the access to specialist module. Um, which is one of the modules from the uh, CG CAP survey, and it's aimed at monitoring beneficiary access to specialists because, again, that's another one of the concerns that providers have raised is that perhaps beneficiaries will not believe that they have access to some of these um, 
specialty care providers. And there are, even though the ACO program, you know, continues to flourish, um, many specialty physicians continue to take a watch and see or a wait and see approach to determine whether or not this is the type of alternative payment model that is going to be um, beneficial for them to participate in. There has been so much concern surrounding this conundrum with regard to ACO exclusivity, and that largely has to do with the fact that when the ACO final regulation was initially released, it was widely interpreted as allowing specialty providers to practice in multiple ACOs. And in fact, I would say that when the Congress um, put forward the accountable care organization, including provisions for shared savings programs, that was probably more or less the intent. However, as a result of some of the analytical um, issues surrounding all of that, it was impossible from CMS's perspective to really address this exclusivity problem. And so as a result, they had to make any participant who bills for E&M services exclusive. And um, it was believed initially that um, specialty providers could simply refer their patients to see a primary care physician so that way they could at least have that one uh, primary care service provided by a primary care physician, and that would help to prevent the specialist from having uh, beneficiaries assigned to it, which was believed to be the link to exclusivity. And as you can see here on the slide, um, these um, frequently asked questions come directly from CMS's website. And I'll just read off this first one for you. I am a medical specialist in solo practice, and I bill for office evaluation and management services that are included in the definition of primary care services. Is it true that I must keep my TIN exclusive to one ACO? And of course, the answer is yes. Now, if you, as a solo practitioner, also participate in another practice and you work in two practices that have two separate TINs, perhaps you would be able to participate in more than one ACO using two, your two different TINs. Um, there could be, come some challenges there. I know there have been some specialty care providers that are very interested in participating in ACOs but have talked about taking their own practices and splitting them up in, in ways um, in which they would be able to have more than one tax ID number, but there are a number of legal challenges that um, you would want to speak with your legal representation about to make sure that that's something that will work for you and that's appropriate for you and for your practice. So just another um, FAQ that came from uh, CMS's website that really speaks to the issue that I was talking about before, which is if I can make sure that none of my patients are assigned to me and that I can refer them to see their primary care doctor to avoid having anyone um, in the ACO assigned to me directly, would that help me? And as you can see here from CMS's answer, um, the answer was no. So aside from the exclusivity concerns that specialty care providers have raised, there are two other major concerns. One is access to care, and that concern stems from the fact that accountable care organizations inherently have um, a desire to ensure that their beneficiary population stays inside the ACO because that's where they have the most control over those providers and they want those beneficiaries to seek care within the ACO. But with the accountable care organization model and it being a part of fee-for-service, Medicare beneficiaries are allowed to go outside of the ACO. They're allowed to see whatever providers are willing to take their Medicare insurance. And so to the extent that um, beneficiaries are leaving the ACO, um, that, could, that will ensure that they perhaps continue to have access to specialty care. But the other concern is that if there are not enough specialists within the accountable care organization as providers, then the beneficiaries may not realize that they can go outside of the ACO and, and seek care, and thus the access will be limited. It's kind of like an intra-ACO gatekeeper model, if you will. And last but not least, one of the other significant concerns that specialty care providers have raised um, relates to the distribution of shared savings. So one of the benefits of being a provider in an accountable care organization is to the extent that there are shared savings, those shared savings are supposed to be distributed among the ACO participants. 
there has been some significant concern that because this is a primary care physician model um, driven um, alternative payment model that most of the savings would automatically go to primary care providers and that the specialty providers who believe that they have made some significant contributions to the patient's care and improved coordination and um, a reduction in resource use will not see any of those savings. And so there have been some specialty providers that have sought um, guidelines from uh, CMS that would help dictate um, how those shared savings, if any, would be distributed among those um, providers. Apart from the um, traditional Medicare Accountable Care Organization model, there are two other models. There are pioneer ACOs, and actually there are now 23 in operation, um, no longer 32. There are just 23 in operation now. And the pioneer um, ACO model was designed for those organizations that were already doing robust care coordination within their communities and were really kind of the leaders, if you will, in this uh, type of alternative payment model. And so for those organizations that felt like they were really ready, they, they'd already got their feet wet in this type of model, they could decide that they wanted to join as a pioneer and take on a much greater um, potential for uh, shared savings as well as a much higher um, level of risk. And there, again, there were 32 in operation, but that number has um, since reduced to 23, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Um, in addition, there is another, another um, ACO model, which is the advanced payment model, and this is for those groups that, um, and particularly in the rural area, that believe that they were ready to take on um, some risk and potentially receive some shared savings, but they didn't have the capital in order to, to, to start up an accountable care organization. Because as you can imagine, there is a great need for strong infrastructure, um, particularly when it comes to, um, to uh, health IT and, and data management and so on. And so there is this other model that would provide some additional financial support um, up front for those, um, those groups that are, that are ready to, to take on some shared savings and potential risk. So thinking about the future of accountable care organizations, um, I would say that it continues to be important to watch the pioneer ACOs and to see what's happening with respect to them. Um, in uh, February of 2013, um, 30, the 32 pioneers that had been in existence at that time were very concerned about some aspects of their model. Um, some of those concerns related to insufficient data for the quality measures, um, some of the benchmarks, and the fact that there were some Medicare Advantage data being used in setting those benchmarks. Um, on the whole, CMS rejected much of the pioneers' concerns, although they have later come out and made some modifications to the ACO program um, in order to alleviate some of those concerns. Um, but unfortunately, um, because of these significant challenges, there were nine ACOs that decided to drop out of the pioneer program. There were a few that decided they wanted to continue to be ACOs, but they wanted to move into the traditional shared savings program ACO model from the pioneer. And then there were some others that just completely um, fell apart and decided they didn't want to be um, an accountable care organization at all. Um, we know that um, CMS is planning to come out with some additional uh, regulations that are going to modify the ACO program, not only on the shared savings side, but also for the pioneers. Um, and we anticipate that they're going to address a number of the concerns that we have um, shared with you today with respect to the analytics and the size of um, accountable care organizations and what that means in terms of the um, uncertainty in terms of who's going to get uh, a shared saving and who's going to be penalized perhaps unfairly, um, the exclusivity issue, um, the access to care issue, and the distribution of shared savings issue. In fact, there is a regulation that is sitting right now um, at the um, Office of Management and Budget um, waiting for review, and hopefully it will be released in the next um, month or so. 
Um, in terms of, of physicians and what they should be doing when it comes to their participation in ACOs, um, we would tell you that your best bet is to closely review those ACO agreements and to look at some of the issues that we've discussed with you today and to make sure that you're talking with your Medicare beneficiaries about accountable care organizations, whether they're in an ACO or not, making sure that they're aware of the, the benefits to belonging to an ACO, um, ensuring that they recognize that they're able to continue to see you if you are not part of an ACO, um, that care um, continue to be um, had outside of that accountable care organization. So just a, a few other um, statistics. Um, there are um, approximately 360 um, ACOs right now covering um, over 5 million beneficiaries, and those statistics are as of uh, January of 2014. Um, the average ACO um, startup costs are about 1.7 million. Um, and, and of the 114 organizations that formed an ACO in 2012, uh, slightly more than half did not reduce health spending below targets. Um, 29 ACOs did reduce spending enough to share in the savings, while the rest only marginally slowed health spending. Um, ACOs brought $128 million to the Medicare Program Trust Fund, which is a plus, a plus. And ACOs received approximately $126 million in shared savings. I'll just point out one other um, issue that's been raised by the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, which is a, an organization that makes recommendations to the Congress on Medicare payment policy. And one of the things that they have said about accountable care organizations, because they've been very strong proponents of this potential model, but they have raised some concerns about how sustainable is an accountable care organization. Once you've addressed all of the low-hanging fruit how do you continue to achieve savings um, and reduce spending um, without, for lack of a better example, cutting into the meat <laughs> and going into the bone? Um, so just a couple of things for you um, to be thinking about as you are contemplating your um, engagement and involvement in accountable care organizations. And quite frankly, some of these same types of concerns um, may also emerge in other alternative payment models that you may be considering either at the federal level or at the commercial level. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Stephen Boswell. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, I think I'll start by telling you a little bit about uh, the organization um, that uh, I'm part of and how it fits into the ACO that, that we have joined. Uh, we're a federally qualified uh, health center uh, we care for roughly 25,000 patients, about 2,000 patients with HIV infection. Um, we uh, have roughly 400 employees, uh, roughly a $75 million uh, budget. Um, so we're, as community health centers go, we are uh, above average in terms of size, but not one of the very largest community health centers uh, in the country. We do care for a disproportionate number of people with uh, HIV infection, uh, and I'll bring that up later as, as we uh, uh, talk a little bit more about, uh, about the special aspects of HIV as it relates to ACOs. Um, a number of years ago, uh, we were in Massachusetts, in Boston, Massachusetts, so uh, many of you may know that, that Massachusetts, uh, a number of years ago, made a decision as a state that uh, it would um, uh, grab a hold of the health care uh, cost problem, uh, specifically from the Medicaid uh, perspective, but it was a general concern that all businesses had that the costs of health care in Massachusetts were a significant problem. So about seven years ago, we moved into uh, a system um, uh, that's very similar to what's happening at the federal level with some small, uh, with some subtle changes that I won't go into in detail. Uh, in this talk, but um, you know, perhaps in a, a future conversation, we can actually go into some of those in more detail because they're, they actually turn out to be some of them turn out to be important. Um, so uh, we've been involved in this for some time, and uh, when we first started thinking about participating in this, 
uh, we were obviously concerned about issues of adverse selection. That is, our patient population doesn't represent uh, a typical patient population, both because we're a community health center and we care for anybody regardless of their ability to pay, uh, which attracts uh, often some very complicated patients, and because we're uh, a health center that's associated uh, with the LGBT community and as a consequence see a disproportionate number of HIV uh, positive patients. Um, and both of those things can create significant problems with regard to, to estimating budgets and things like that. Um, so for us, what was really critically important as we started to think about this was, was trying to find the right partners uh, to do this with. Uh, and by that, I, I mean both uh, a major hospital partner, uh, but also specialists who really understood what we were trying to do. Um, that the country was asking us to, to really focus on costs uh, and to improve the overall quality that, that uh, we were able to deliver. Uh, and uh, that both of those things uh, didn't just depend on the primary care docs, although they are, are central to uh, most of this work, uh, but also uh, required the engagement of specialists, hospitals, uh, acute hospitals, uh, SNFs, rehab hospitals, uh, the VNA, um, a whole set of different uh, providers in the community to pull together in what the federal government uh, through the ACA came to call accountable care organizations, uh, an engaged set of providers within that organization that would work together to improve both quality and to, to manage costs more effectively than we had in the past. And, and we were lucky here in Boston in that we had a, a very uh, engaged partner, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center uh, in Boston. Um, and, and it was through that relationship, uh, and I, I had been in the leadership of our uh, physician organization at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, that we uh, decided to form uh, this ACO that uh, became known as Beth Israel Deaconess Care Organization, our ACO. Um, since the beginning of, of that process, we have now added a number of hospitals and a number of other providers from around the, the eastern region of Massachusetts. Uh, so we are, are larger now than we have uh, ever been. Uh, we have roughly uh, 120,000 uh, at-risk lives that are covered by the ACO. Um, and that's uh, roughly for us uh, about a billion dollars in total uh, business um, uh, involved in that uh, uh, 120,000 lives. Um, so uh, it's, uh, we, we are not just involved, we are one of the, our ACO is, is one of the pioneer ACOs uh, that you heard about uh, a little while ago. Uh, but we also have a number of other commercial contracts that are structured in very similar ways um, that have budgets that we need to operate by um, and expectations around quality, uh, all of which are a little bit different from contract to contract, which is a, a one of the problems that, that we often run into is trying to pull together these quality metrics and overall performance metrics into one set of metrics uh, that are consistent across the ACO uh, is a high priority uh, for us. And we've been fairly successful at doing that, but not entirely successful. So it does create some, some complications in, in managing this. Our ACO has uh, roughly this year a budget, uh, an operating budget of about $20 million. Uh, roughly 100 staff uh, are involved in the ACO uh, in all sorts of, of different uh, capacities. Uh, uh, and I won't go into all the details there, but it's a fairly complicated organization. So uh, the one thing I would say about ACOs in general is, is that they need to be of sufficient size in terms of the total number of lives that are covered in an ACO to really make the investment in infrastructure that's necessary to be successful make sense. So it's a, it's a complicated uh, decision that, that uh, involves a lot of different moving pieces, uh, but overall that balance is, is critically important to the ultimate success uh, of an ACO. So finding the right partners, uh, having early discussions about what the goals are around 
Um, the formation of the ACO is really critically important. Um, and then I'd say, you know, really remaining involved in the governance and operations of the ACO is also critically important. So, so I sit, still sit on the, the board of directors of the physician organization, uh, but I also sit on the board of directors of, uh, on the contracts and payments committee of the uh, uh, physician organization and the ACO. Um, and that's for those who, who have that interest and skill, it's a critically important uh, area for you to remain engaged, um, in part because there, there are many different interests that often sit around uh, the table uh, where these uh, contracts, uh, the outlines for these contracts are really created. Um, and if you're not sitting at the table, uh, an old friend of mine used to say, you're often on the menu. So uh, being present and engaged in that process is critically important. Um, and I, I'll give you an example of, of where uh, this was um, uh, important uh, this last year. Um, many of you know that, that hepatitis C is undergoing uh, just revolutionary changes um, in terms of, of just uh, great improvements of care. Um, and we're in the middle of that right now. Um, we negotiated a number of our contracts, commercial uh, and, in, in fact, the uh, Pioneer ACO contracts, a number of years ago before um, it was clear that these treatments were going to be as successful as they now clearly have become, uh, and before we knew what the cost of those treatments would be. So uh, you can understand problem that these, this advance in treatment represents to budgets that were in fact fixed a number of years ago, um, to our ability to actually both meet patient needs in terms of bringing these advanced treatments uh, to them, but also um, trying to stay within the contracted budget um, uh, agreement. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, uh, I was actually the person on the, the board, uh, the Contracts and Payments Committee of the ACO that actually brought this atten to the attention of, uh, of our ACO about nine months ago, uh, in part because this is a, a population that we're particularly concerned about. Um, and uh, we actually did a, a very uh, rapid analysis of what the impact of this would mean for our ACO potentially. And for drug costs alone, we determined that the, the potential hit to us could be, as an ACO, could be as much as $70 million. So uh, recognizing that to, made us immediately move to uh, our partners, our uh, insurers, basically, and, uh, and start negotiations about how we were going to manage this. And, and I don't want to imply that we are uh, entirely finished uh, trying to manage this issue, but we have gone a long way over the last six months in, in working out uh, how uh, the insurance companies and uh, our ACO would manage these costs. Um, and I, I have to say we've had some really great partners in this, and they've been um, fairly flexible in, in helping us work out budgets in a way that that doesn't uh, put us out of business, uh, but still allows us to bring um, the very best care uh, to our patients. So staying involved in the governance and operations of the ACO is critically important. Um, and then finally, I would say that it's, it's very important to remain committed uh, to the success of the ACO. And, and what that means for a place like uh, Fenway Health, um, is that, that it is a priority that our, um, all of us as clinicians are evaluated on our ability to deliver uh, the highest quality care, uh, which we measure, uh, and to, to stay within budgets uh, that have been set up um, to manage that care. That requires a significant infrastructure, um, both in people and in data systems that is critically important. Some of the data systems that are most important are obviously the, the electronic medical record. The movement to EMRs over the last um, 
you know, five years or so in the United States, um, has has been a central part of of the idea of moving uh, all of us to new modes of payment, um, so that we can capture data that actually allows us to measure what we're doing. Uh, determine what works, what doesn't work, and to measure the overall quality of care that we're providing. So these data systems, starting with an EMR, are critically important. But the EMRs have to be structured in such, such a way that they can actually um, measure the, the variables that you will be assessed by. And that uh, sounds trivial in some ways, but um, I can assure you, having done this now for, for many years, it, 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 is, it is often very difficult to make sure that all of those data are in place and, and being collected on an ongoing basis uh, in a way that allows you to, uh, to show the, the good work that you're, you're doing. Uh, and in, in addition to, to the central role of the electronic medical record, a, a lot of the information that you get uh, for both quality and for budgets really comes from claims um, that are still used in the background to track overall costs of care. And those, those claims-based data, those data actually have to be fed back to clinicians uh, in addition to the data that clinicians have from the electronic medical record in a way that's usable, digestible, uh, and, and um, points clinicians very quickly to action items that they can address um, that will improve their performance. Um, this is a very big task. And without the right kind of leadership to keep uh, all of us focused on, on the most important three or four or five things that we can do, um, clinicians often will just will get lost um, in the mountains of data and information that they're being fed. So, so really thoughtful implementation of of these systems uh, that are feeding data back to clinicians is also critically important. Uh, and and uh, quite honestly, having done this for, for many years, a job that I think is never entirely complete. Uh, I mean, we are still today modifying many of the, the systems to uh, improve their overall uh, function. Um, but I think that's what I would say is, is that, that if you're going to be successful at this, you really have to commit yourself to it. Um, you have to get all of your clinicians engaged, and you have to be um, focused on, on making sure that, that we as clinicians don't become frustrated uh, and throw up our hands because the systems don't work, the data are wrong, uh, any of a number of different excuses that that any of us might come up with uh, if we're not happy with the results. It's, it's really critically important that the implementation be done in a thoughtful way. Um, now, having said all this, this, this it, to, to do all of this work uh, costs um, more money. There's no question about it. Um, we have had to, at Fenway, add additional staff um, to actually help uh, bring data together, uh, to analyze those data, and then feed those back to clinicians. We have uh, had to, to uh, obtain software that allows us to do it in a way that we think is most helpful to clinicians. Uh, and we are constantly looking for additional ways to make things more uh, easier, let's say, for the clinicians, because this, this is a heavy burden, especially on primary care doctors and uh, mid-level clinicians to, to be successful at, at, uh, uh, at this new form of, of reimbursement. Um, my overall estimate is, is the, the cost for this can be upwards of 20% more than what your costs were before you moved into this uh, mode of, of, um, uh, of uh, reimbursement. It's, it's not a trivial uh, issue, and uh, within our ACO, we pay for these costs through what are called withholds, um, and those withholds are taken not just from uh, primary care, but from um, the specialists, uh, and the hospitals all contribute to the, the uh, ACO as well. 
Uh, so all the providers participate in supporting the ACO. In our ACO, we have arranged it so if there is any benefit, that benefit comes back primarily to primary care clinicians. Um, and the reason for that is, is the recognition that these costs to do this kind of an operation are simply uh, added to the to costs uh, that we were uh, incurring before in terms of caring for patients and that, that primary care um, and already underpaid uh, specialty um, uh, would have a hard time managing those additional costs if, if these dollars didn't flow back. So, um, so I hope that gives you a, a sense of, of how we function. We, we have done uh, relatively well um, in, in these uh, uh, contracts. Uh, I will tell you we've, we've now been managing these contracts for about three years. Um, it has gotten harder and harder to, to manage uh, these costs as, as other providers are also starting to engage in improving the quality of their care and, and decreasing their costs. So um, that is a, a constant challenge. It, it's not that you, once you're successful, you're guaranteed to be successful uh, into the future. Um, you, you basically have to continually improve what you're doing. Um, and I, I believe ultimately we'll have to structure slightly different uh, contracts uh, as we move forward. We have structured contracts in our commercial area, for example, that, that really focus on uh, what's referred to as the Eastern Network trend, which refers to the trend cost, the cost trends for the providers in the eastern part of Massachusetts. And if we perform better than the average by a certain amount, we're generally successful. And, and because we've had such a, an engaged ACO, we, we have generally performed um, much better than the average and have done relatively well. And I, I believe in the Pioneer ACO, we just got data for last year, we were the second best performing uh, Pioneer ACO in the country. So, um, so you can be successful at this, but it requires real engagement, careful thought, um, a lot of, of uh, a careful attention to the load that this puts on, on uh, primary care clinicians uh, and thoughtful um, engagement around how to, to try to minimize uh, that additional work. So with that, um, I'm uh, um, open to questions. I think we're going to have questions now. Yes, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Boswell, and also to Emily and Shana. Uh, we will now uh, open the floor, uh, unmute the lines, and please, if you have a question, uh, if you can identify yourself and where you're calling from, and we'll be pleased to t take your questions. Hi, this is Andrea Weddle with HIVMA. I, I'll kick off the questions. Um, Dr. Buzzle, what has been the patient experience of your involvement with the ACOs? Have they um, been able to stay with their providers, and are they aware that you are participating in the ACO? Um, some of the patients are uh, aware that, that uh, we're in, uh, in an ACO. Uh, it depends a, a little bit on the in, uh, particular insurance product. And in general, it's a, uh, I, I have generally found patients to be um, not as engaged in this pro pro process overall as uh, the clinicians uh, are. Um, and in, in general, we, we don't find a whole lot of change. If, if there are some changes, it's, it's actually that certain things are getting done on a very regular basis now that, that weren't done as regularly previously. Um, we've developed systems here, for example, uh, for using iPads to assess uh, uh, depression, for example, um, and we have um, um, systems that operate in the background to determine how frequently they need to, to be done. Um, these kinds of systems now are, are new to patients, and uh, we found them generally, uh, patients to be very engaged in, in this process, and they, they like the new technology. Um, but, but patients are not as engaged, and, and they're often uh, unaware that they're even in this kind of a system. And from the standpoint of, of Medicare in particular, CMS has structured this, uh, their ACO model in such a way that as to minimize the effect it really has on patients themselves. Patients 
in fact, can go anywhere for their care, uh, which is often a, a problem uh, for uh, uh, for the ACO itself because uh, the minute a patient steps out of your ACO, you lose control of those costs and, and often have to pay charges at other ACOs that are much higher than what your own would be. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. This is Kim with HIVMA. I was also wondering, those that 20% cost increase that you would assume over the old way of doing business, um, unless you're one of those that um, took an advance payment from CMS, was that difficult to manage in the beginning? Or I mean, you mentioned about these withholds. Um, that you used over time. That sounds like really, is that something that you came up with um, as an ACO on your own, or how did you manage this, this cost in the beginning? Well, we, we did come up with that as the only option for us moving forward, and it was critically important to yeah. us that, that we actually yeah. spread those costs over all oh. of the providers involved. Okay. So, yeah, so we, we, decided, we made a decision up front that we would, uh, we would take these withholds uh, from all the clinicians, basically all the people who build on the budget, um, and that, that if we were successful, um, people would get their withholds back and the, the surpluses would go to the primary care clinicians to help support the infrastructure that they'd built. Um, and then there's, you know, for us, roughly a $20 million central office uh, infrastructure that we have to support as well. Wow. And uh, so do you see, Steve, in the... Um Within this model, between the primary care providers, because I understand it's very, you know, primary care provider, but uh, are there tensions between the specialists and the primary care providers, or you know, I, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, um, there are tensions across the board between the hospitals, the uh, everyone who participates, um, uh, you know, has has their own. Uh, area that they need to defend, and um, and the the two groups that that quite honestly feel often the most put upon uh, are the hospital uh, and specialists. Um, I think it's it's generally agreed by by many healthcare specialists <laughs> that in the United States uh, we do a lot more to people than. Um, is probably warranted based on the the quality of care that that uh, people are receiving. The the cost uh, in some countries in Europe, for example, is uh, per capita half the cost that it is in the United States, and their quality metrics um, are actually better. So the 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 thinking is that there's a lot of uh, unnecessary care that's going on both in hospitals and. Uh, in outpatient settings with specialists, um, and the the trick here is to really identify what is the unnecessary care, and how do we bring it in? Because uh, specialists uh, in these models are often um, uh, still operating in a fee-for-service basis. That is, the more they do, the more they uh, you know are paid, uh, and as a consequence. Um, that you need to find a specialist partner who gets what you're trying to do, and in exchange for using them um, preferentially in your referrals, uh, is willing to work with you uh, in a way that allows you to improve those quality metrics and and um, and keep costs under control. Um, and not all specialists are fully engaged in in that process, but they are out there, and uh, so. Uh, this year, one of the things that we have started to do is, is actually to rate specialists. So our primary care clinicians get together on a quarterly basis and review in a very structured way the performance of specialists in our ACO, and we limit the number of specialists that we refer to based on those assessments. Um, and as a consequence, uh, we work with a smaller number of specialists in every area uh, and we have, in general, much better relationships with us with them because because we make a commitment back to them, and they make a commitment to us to communicate better, um, to operate in ways that work well for specialists. You know, uh, 
Um, some specialists will complain that they're often referred patients. For example, a surgeon is referred a patient that doesn't need surgery, and it's very frustrating for them. So working out some of those issues um, in terms of what they would really need to see in their office and, and how they would like us to manage these patients before they ever get to their office is not just beneficial to, to us, but to them as well. So finding those specialists who are really willing to work with you in that way is critically important to the success of these ACs. Okay, well, thank you, Steve. That's super, super informative. And I just wanted to check with the, the group. Does anyone else have a question? We're coming close to closing time. Okay, well, thank you, Steve, Shana, and Emily for very informative presentations. Um, and as I mentioned, these, this will go online um, along with the issue brief. We truly appreciate your participation and thank you for joining us today. We look forward to following this topic um, as it evolves in the future. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a great day.